Uh, thank you very much indeed to Christine for that lovely introduction. Thank you to you for uh, being here. Um, I hope you've had a good time so far. Um, I hope I at least won't detract from that um, uh, in what I'm about to say. Um, and um, uh, I do just want to say a word about this gathering. Uh, I mean, it is uh, terrific, actually, for uh, a group as broad and diverse as this to be uh, gathering around the Word of God and to be looking at uh, playful and insightful and wise and deep and penetrating ways of uh, rereading the scriptures in order to edify our teaching and learning uh, and indeed our own education as well in order to pass that on. So thank you to you for being here. And um, I hope that what uh, follows in the next uh, hour, I'll try and be brief, um, will be something that uh, adds just a tiny bit of value to what I know has been already uh, a feast, uh, a banquet uh, for uh, many of you really. Um, I need just to do the usual caveats right at the beginning and say that I'm not a biblical scholar, so uh, I am what's called a Bible busker. I kind of um, make it up as I go along, really, within reason. Um, uh, and obviously, I, I, I natter away to people who are much more expert than I am, really, like Paula, for example, who you've heard, really. Uh, and uh, we uh, chat from time to time, really. I've learned recently over the last couple of years that... Uh, there's some strange sinking going on in our thinking, really, uh, without necessarily reading the same books, and as will become apparent uh, as we talk, but without uh, having had the benefit of hearing her uh, the other day, uh, some of the things I've actually got to say will uh, clearly resonate with uh, what she brought to this, really. So let me say at the beginning, um, I very rarely uh, watch television, so when I do switch on, uh, I do so in order to switch off. Um, I don't really know what to watch. I lack discernment, but I have enjoyed episodes of Killing Eve, wickedly dark and funny. Um, I've thought about hiring her, obviously, but that's another thing. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> don't, please don't tweet any of this, all right? Um, uh, I don't follow any soaps. I've never watched an episode of Love Island, which I naively assume must be about a PCC away day that goes badly wrong. <laughs> with all the members marooned as castaways, but apparently not. It's full of uh, fit millennials chatting about relationships dressed in swimwear. Who knew? Yeah. Uh, I've pitched an idea to ITV, which I think is much better, which is the PCC away day, uh, still with the swimwear and the jacuzzi. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, you want, you want therapy for that. Um, titles, I think, are misleading, aren't they? Uh, Morse is about a grumpy detective. It's not about a Second World War code cracker. Love Island is not about a PCC or much about love, I gather. Nor is it much of an island, actually, if TV crews come and go wantonly and you share your intimate romps with millions of viewers. Uh, Neighbours from Hell is not about living in the middle of an Oxford college. Um, <laughs> I repeat, don't tweet. And uh, in the Bible, titles and subtitles are incredibly misleading. The parable of the sower is not about the sower, it's about the seed. The parable of the wise and foolish virgins is not about them, it's about the groom. Um, it's not about the bridesmaids. And the parable of the Good Samaritan is also misnamed because there are no Good Samaritans. That's the point. They're all a bad bunch. So it's about something else. And as I hope will be obvious to you, uh, Jesus and uh, the Bible uh, did not give subtitles or titles to any of the stories that were told. They've all been inserted by a rather lazy marketing department somewhere that hasn't quite understood the point of the story. A much better title for the Good Samaritan would be Neighbours from Hell, because actually Samaritans were the neighbours from Hell as far as the, Jude uh, the Judean audience was concerned. So I want to talk about the parable of the prodigal son, because it's another terribly misnamed parable. Uh, and uh, in true uh, Oxbridge style, I've provided you with a handout. Unlike Oxbridge style, it's colour, um, <laughs> and it has some pictures on it, um, and not a lot of information. But um, I want to start with the word prodigal. 
What does it mean? Here's what the dictionary says. A back formation from prodigality, Middle French, prodigal, directly from the Latin prodigalis, wasteful, waste. Agree to, to set in motion, to perform, to drive, to draw out. A prodigal person is a wasteful person, somebody who just wastes a lot of things. Other dictionaries say prodigal means to wastefully or be recklessly extravagant. Prodigal expenditure, giving or yielding profusely. Lavishness, but without counting the cost. Prodigal with money, abundance, profuse. Nature's prodigal resources, all of those things. It's folly, it's stupid, it's reckless. But the question is, in this parable, who is prodigal? We're sometimes, I think, not well served by our standard ways of reading texts, which sometimes assumes, in this case, that the father is God, the errant young son stands as a cipher for we sinners. Granted, we're Christians, so we only claim our status as honorary sinners. We're not real ones, of course. Um, <laughs> And the older son is a code, of course, for uh, curmudgeonly churches that prefer to ration grace and mercy. But I want right at the beginning of this to suggest to you that one way of reading this parable, and I'm going to do two or three different ways, is to see the father as wasteful. He divides his inheritance, a bit like a rash King Lear, but instead of three daughters, two sons. Thus, the father is profligate. He's actually negligent. He divides the business in a way that's quite prodigal, quite wasteful. He's a poor role model. The younger son, of course, is profligate too. As the saying in Yorkshire go, he spends the money on wine and gambling, and the, west, the rest he wastes on women. <laughs> the older son seemingly is the opposite of wastefulness because, in fact, he seems to be a hoarder, but he wastes things too. The opportunity to join in, to be gracious, to be merciful, to be giving. And the father, don't forget, at the end of this parable, a bit like Lear in King Lear, kills a calf that's not his, throws a feast that the older son is actually paying for, and gives a ring to the younger son that presumably belongs to the older son. This is, in other words, the parable of a lost family. The father and the sons have no idea really how to manage their resources and their money. They need that advisor from Lloyd's TSB to get them all together in a room and talk about money. That's what they need to do. <laughs> and yet, as we shall see, this is also clearly a parable about extraordinary, unmerited Utterly unlimited grace. Think of Narnia and Aslan just for a moment. Now, if you're under 35, and some of you are, the Narnia Chronicles, let me just say this, are children's books written by somebody called C.S. Lewis. <laughs> and if you're none the wiser, it's like Game of Thrones, but without the incest and the gratuitous violence. Or The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, in which Gandalf has been replaced by a lion. If you're over 35, can I just remind you that the Narnia Chronicles are children's books written by somebody called C.S. Lewis, and they're not actually written as uh, supplementary stories for the Alpha Course. <laughs> uh, for the obvious reason that Lewis was writing 40 years before uh, the Guide to All Things Christian copyrighted, trademarked, etc., really took off. Now, I'm beginning with these rather teasing cultural references because I think this parable is maybe one of the deepest that we have in the whole of the New Testament. It was Martin Luther that said um, that if this parable was all you had in the New Testament, in his opinion, it was enough. It's quite something to say that. Artists have painted it, singers have sung it, filmmakers have filmed it, 
poets have scripted it, and so have novelists. But I want to suggest to you that at the heart of this parable is something that's very common to us all as people and as churches and indeed as a nation. And it's something that we very, very rarely talk about. And it sometimes goes to the heart of some of the things that are the most painful things for us to deal with. I speak, of course, about shame culture and the business of shame. I don't mean here being embarrassed or caught out. I'm talking about shame. Shame culture in any society, whether it's a Near East ancient society like the one Jesus was talking to, or our own, puts you face to face with things that it's actually not only not polite to talk about in polite company, it's so deep you probably are not going to actually even talk to your wife or your husband or your lover or your parents about. Shame is different. And all three characters in this parable, the father and the two sons, carry shame. The father and the younger son for sure, because the older son, the shame is how the parable ends. But for the father, it's the complete failure of any prudent husbandry. And for the younger son, it's the expending of the seemingly unlimited resources of that inheritance that goes so fast and doesn't really go very far. Shame is stuff that we just don't like to talk about. I can't tell her about that because it was only a one-night stand and I was drunk and it meant nothing and it would destroy our relationship if she knew. I can't tell him because I thought the relationship we had was coming to an end and that was just, well, just a season. I can't actually go out socially because I'm worried I might not stay dry or I might smell. Shame. This is deep stuff. And when you're talking about people's shame, this is the stuff they really want to conceal. They can't bear other people to know because what will happen if they know? The fear is they will lose their value and the consequence of losing their value is they will be unpersoned, disfellowshipped, marginalized, unfamilied, divorced. I think we all carry shame. And this parable is very much about that, what's being carried. Shame risks disgust, censure, withdrawal from the people we trust to love us. Suppose my shame and what I conceal causes the rejection of me. What then? So we keep it in and it festers. The son felt not guilt, but shame the younger son. He knew he'd shamed his father publicly and amongst his neighbors and his peers. The father has shamed. He's ashamed of his son, but he's ashamed of what he's done and let him do. By losing his son to idle and profligate spending, he's been shamed in his community and he's diminished in the eyes of his older son. This is awful. He's become, as it were, not the father he was as a result of what he's done. And I expect the older son thought he was doing his father a favor by staying on at the farm. Charity, albeit rather patronizing, condescending kindness. But he's ashamed of the feast at the end because it undoes everything that he'd been working so hard for, getting the farm back and running rehiring servants who've gone. In some sense, then, the father's gesture to the younger son is revolutionary in character because he doesn't deal with guilt by forgiveness because that's actually not enough. It's just not enough. Rather, he deals with shame by redemptive, excessive public celebration. The only way to really smash shame and deal with it and to restore a person to their rightful 
place as an equal citizen, member of a family or a community, is to do so publicly. To say, you matter, you belong. We love you anyway, and we're prepared to wipe out the past and wipe out the stains that you think you have and begin again. It addresses humiliation. It redeems the individual from what they've got into. It destroys shame. Maybe that's why the older brother just can't cope, because deep down, he's basically an Anglican Pelagian. You earn salvation, but don't tell anybody. God is running a kind of secret club card loyalty bonus scheme. <laughs> and any member of church knows that. You join the scheme when you join the church, and it titles you to extra grace, special offers on God's love. And the cardholder can feel ever so slightly smug, because you're just getting things that the rest of the world are not. Prayers answered, extra bits of love and insight. To get the card, of course, you join a church, and provided you take your turn of duties, coffee rotors, visiting, PCCs, the card is yours. And the best schemes are run by what I'd call proper tribes, like Anglo-Catholics and Evangelicals. They really are clubs, and they know how to reward their members. Points, and points, as you know, mean prizes. <laughs> and to be frank, and please don't tweet this, the parable of the prodigal family says bollocks to that, okay? <laughs> Rubbish. This is not what the gospel is about. God's love is a pardon for fools for absolute idiots who've got themselves into a terrible mess. People who get themselves in total and utter shtuk. The woman at the well, what's her story in the Gospel of John? The one caught in adultery, any offers? The one who um, breaks in to the feast of Simon the Pharisee in Luke 7, and the only thing that she can think of doing, and this beggar's belief, doesn't it, is giving Jesus a sensual, scented pedicure. She's not there to seduce him. She's just there to do something interesting with the soles of his feet and work in between those toes. Because, well, that's what you do with nice oil. She's got to show her love and appreciation somehow. And why is she there? Because she's brought in with her shame. And what does Jesus say to each of these three women? You are forgiven. You are. You're forgiven. They don't get to confess much. Certainly the woman in Simon the Pharisee's house. Not a lot from the woman who's caught in adultery. I uh, mentioned uh, just uh, a moment ago that I wanted to say something about uh, the connections of this parable uh, with culture. And I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, The Wizard of Oz and Elton John's Goodbye Yellow Brick Road and a little bit later, um, Yip Halberg's Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Let's begin with Oz. In the film The Wizard of Oz, it ends with Dorothy wishing that she was home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. And of course, as you may realize, if you've seen the film, and many of us have many times, it's essentially a prayer. The prayer that's answered in the parable, actually. You were lost, maybe dead, maybe never entitled to get back home. But you were never, ever, ever lost to that home. No one is. Nothing and nobody is lost to God. So long before you were within sight of home, you are greeted and affirmed and welcomed back. So there's a real sense in which this parable is a template for the film and indeed the book of the film, which is much, much earlier. Now, The Wizard of Oz, sung by a young woman called Judy Garland, and the film is based on the allegorical fairy tale by Frank Baum, written in 1900. You may not know this, but uh, the clue to what this film is about, and the book is about, is all in the title Oz. Because Baum wrote this as a satirical critique of fools 
who went on gold rushes, who just left everything, their farm, their poverty, their family, and went hundreds, sometimes thousands of miles to gold rushes to spend tons of time in squalid camps looking for tiny little nuggets of gold, panning as they were in rivers or mining. So Oz means ounce. That's what it is. It's an abbreviation for ounce. The Wizard of Oz is the Wizard of, the wizard of Ounce. And the Yellow Brick Road is a bit like Dick Whittington. It's the road paved with gold. That's the point. And these characters who go on that road in Baum's tale are all in their different ways fools. They're represented very clearly by the scarecrow, a poor rural farmer, the tin woodman who stands in Baum's tale as a greedy industrialist, the lion as somebody who lacks moral courage, and Dorothy who's simply gullible and innocent and taken along for the ride. But the object of Baum's tale was all of these people, all four, are pursuing the holy grail of personal wealth because it will liberate them. But the minute they start their journey, they are lost. Baum uh, died in 1919, a century ago. He was uh, a nominal Anglican, so normal. Um, and um, <laughs> he was, in fact, a member of the Theosophical Society as well. So, again, a normal Anglican, dual passport. Um, but the, the tale is, is riddled with references to the divine. The name Dorothy means gift of God. The tale's a deliberate riff on Dick Whittington's search for gold, or for that matter, Bunyan's progress. The silver slippers in Baum's tale, they're red ruby slippers in the film, but the silver slippers are like scallop shells for pilgrims and baptisms in Baum's original tale. The central message of the story is, there's no place like home. And home is always the place that you belong and will return to. Many people uh, remember the film for Judy Garland's uh, song, which we'll play at uh, the end of this. It won an Oscar in 1939. But of course, it's a lovely melody. It's printed, just the text uh, on your uh, handout. Uh, it's that dreamy, melty quality that um, Yip Halberg and uh, Harold Arlen put into their uh, lyrics, which has been sung again and again over the years by others doing cover versions of it. Uh, and its popularity is actually owed to uh, American servicemen serving overseas in the Second World War, who uh, often were accompanied by that song. So there's that sense in which that story, The Wizard of Oz, I just want you to see that as something that's based on the template of this parable of the prodigality of the son and the father and the older brother. We're dealing with lost people, hapless, hopeless, and yet, right at the end of this, they are returning home where there is fresh, reconfigured, redemptive unity and homecoming in what they are able to enjoy. That's why Dorothy says right at the end of the film, right at the end, in much way I think the younger son might have said, I quote, if I ever go looking for my heart's desire again, I won't look further than my own backyard because if it isn't there, I never really lost it, is how the film ends. It's an extraction from the parable. In the same way, and I've printed the text um, on the uh, handout, you can look in a slightly different way at Elton John's extraordinary song, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. Those of you over 35 will remember the single, of course, 1974. Uh, Elton John and Bernie Taupin. But the Christian rhythm, timbre, and depth of this song will be lost to nearly everybody because you just won't see the song as anything other than about a yellow brick road and possibly a homage to Oz. 
but I'm going to le read you the lyrics because I want you to see what kind of lostness we're talking about. When are you going to come down? When are you going to land? I should have stayed on the farm. I should have listened to my old man. You know you can't hold me forever. I didn't sign up with you. I'm not a present for your friends to open. This boy's too young to be singing the blues. So goodbye, Yellow Brick Road, where the dogs of society howl. You can't plant me in your penthouse. I'm going back to my plow, back to the howling old owl in the woods, back to hunting the horny back toad. I finally decided my future lies beyond the Yellow Brick Road. What do you think you'll do then? I bet you'll shoot down your plane. I'll take you a couple of vodka and tonics to set you on your feet again. Maybe you'll get a replacement. There's plenty like me to be found. Mongrels who ain't got a penny, sniffing for tidbits like you on the ground. What is this song about? It's pretty obvious, isn't it? It's a poor working class lad who's been snapped up as a toy boy by a wealthy patron in a gay relationship, installed in a penthouse, who knows that he is utterly expendable. And that's where his future's gone. And it's been okay, because he's got a lot of things. But you know you can't hold me forever. He's trapped. He's like the youngest son. Goodness knows what the youngest son in the parable had to do to earn that final bit of money to get home. Feeding pigs, I bet you it was worse. I bet you. And I bet you that relationship between him and the prostitutes was reversed. That's what this song's about. <coughs> this kid that Taupin and John have written about is being abused. He's in a penthouse he can't actually get out of. Now, Taupin and uh, uh, John wrote this because um, both, in their very different ways, were utterly enchanted by The Wizard of Oz. I'm not suggesting for a minute they had any sense of how uh, Frank Baum's uh, story depended on Bunyan's progress um, and the parable of uh, the prodigal family. But just in case you doubt my uh, slightly sexualized reading of this song from Elton John. Just remember what was on the B-side on the vinyl single in 1974. This is a pub trivia question par excellence. <laughs> Does anybody know? Hmm? Hmm? Anyway, it's just a song called Screw You. That's what the song's called. And it's the same stuff again. Never really made it into any album, really. And because that title was so uh, sharp, um, it had to be uh, reworked as a title for the American version, where it's called, beautifully, Young Man's Blues. Mm. <laughs> what the parable says, then, is forgiveness is possible after all of this. And what is John and Taupin's subject bringing in that song? Well, they're carrying shame, aren't they? So, this parable is all about people who make a monumental mess of things and still get to go home to that place where they can be affirmed and loved and celebrate unconditionally. And that's why um, I'm very fond of uh, the poem by Harry Smart that's um, also on your handout. I will read it to you, um, and, uh, but you can follow as I'm reading. I should just say, by the way, that the last time I did this at all publicly, uh, I completely forgot uh, that there were people who were signing everything I was saying um, <laughs> for the hard of hearing. Um, and when we got to the first line, um, this is when communication kind of broke down, really. Anyway, here we go. Praise be to God who pities wankers. You have to imagine that in sign language. It's quite interesting, actually. I won't do the hand gesture. Anyway, <laughs> praise be to God who pities wankers and has mercy on miserable bastards. Praise be to God who pours his blessing on reactionary warheads and racists, for he knows what he is doing. 
The healthy have no need of a doctor. The sinless have no need of forgiveness. But you say, they do not deserve it. That is the point. That is the point. When you try to wade through, wade across the estuary at low tide, but misjudge the distance, the currents, the soft ground, and are caught by the flood in deep shtuk, then perhaps you will realize that God is to be praised for delivering dickheads from troubles they've made for themselves. Praise be to God who forgives sinners. Let him who is without sin throw the first headline. Let him who is without sin build the gallows, prepare the noose, say farewell to the convict with a kiss. The parable, oh and by the way, the gospel. Because God's love and mercy is not rationed. You're not actually in charge of this, do you not realize? Nor am I. God's going to love whoever God likes. And it will be unconditional, it will be bountiful, and woe betide any of us, let alone the church, if we start applying terms and conditions on this in order to recruit people into some kind of daft club loyalty scheme. Because that is not the gospel. The gospel is Jesus died for everybody, Jesus loves everybody, God loves everybody, that's your good news. That's it. And there's not a lot more to say other than the fact God's borders, boundaries, are continually open and receptive to wankers, bastards, um, people who um, you know, need a doctor, people who have, leads of lot for, uh, who have lots of needs of forgiveness and constantly misjudge things and actually get into trouble. The father does this. Both sons do this as well. What else can you say about this parable? Well, one way of reading it is to say it's slightly a slightly dysfunctional family. Another way of doing it is to actually do what many people do with this parable and is to assume that the father is somehow a cipher for God, the younger son for the sinner, and the older son a sort of cipher for curmudgeonly uh, churches. So a little bit of autobiography here. When I was about five, um, I got lost, I mean, quite badly, actually. I was following my mother in a department store in London. We lived in Liverpool at the time, and she told me to stick close. It should have been incredibly easy, because uh, we're dealing here in the 1960s, and she had um, uh, a wonderful kind of red leather, meaty-length coat on. So I thought to myself, all I have to do is follow that. Easy. So I did. I followed it. And I, uh, my father went off to look at other stuff. I got distracted by all the things you could see and buy. Um, and I stopped and stared at a new Philips cassette recorder and marveled at the tiny cassettes there. And particularly, I, picked up, I remember picking up one by Andy Williams. Do you remember him? <laughs> you know, a real crooner. Um, and um, I liked it so much, and the picture of him in his kind of, you know, sort of Viella V-neck sweater, I turned around to my mother and I said, look at this. And there was a woman in a red coat. And it wasn't her. Somebody else. And I'm five, I'm tiny. I can't see. I'm quite tiny now, I still can't see. <laughs> what to do? I was lost. I'm in London, first time. I have no idea where I am. I began to cry. I was panicking inside. And someone offered to take me around the store looking for my parents. Well, I mean, I didn't even know who the stranger was. I had no idea. And it must have been about 15 minutes before my mother found me, flanked by two anxious shop assistants. And after the customary words of thanks to the man who'd been helping the search, my mother took me back to a rather frantic father. I think some words may have been exchanged between the two of them. <laughs> some words were certainly said to me. But there you are. Lostness, when it's real lostness, can be incredibly disturbing. And when you're that younger son and you are lost, I want you to get in touch with that sense of lostness. 
It's not that I'm just a bit displaced and I know how to get home, because I've got a kind of spiritual sort of GPS navigator. He's got no idea how to get home or what the reception will be. So I've got a few points to make about reading the parable in this kind of way. The first thing I want you to notice is that when you read Luke chapter 15, you've got three kinds of lostness. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son or the lost family, as I prepare, uh, prefer. We should read them side by side, but when you do, I want you to notice some quite interesting differences between a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost lad. The first thing is to do with value. Even when you've lost the sheep, the sheep still has value, and when you find the sheep again, it basically has the same value. Unless the price of lamb has collapsed after Brexit, and it's been away for a long time, <laughs> you'll get the same money for the sheep that you got yesterday. The lost coin, actually, again, Brexit, unless you can probably spend it. It'll have the same value. But the lost son has become worthless. Literally worthless. He's lost his value. And he's lost it through what he's done with his share of the inheritance. He is literally valueless. And according to the norms of society, there's a sense in which what's been going on with him is his absence and the way he spent that money has made him endure what we would now call anthropologically a social death. He's no longer literally the person that he thought he was. Same name, maybe the same clothes, but that's it. Social death is, by the way, not the same as sending somebody to Coventry. It's the recognition that any value you thought you had can now no longer be cashed in. Um, Emma and I uh, celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary on um, Monday, um, and a um, lovely tea party on Sunday afternoon, and we got lovely gifts, jam, honey, and uh, lots of cards. And the strangest gift I got um, was from uh, a very good friend of mine who gave me uh, a Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe note. I brought it for you here. <laughs> you won't be able to see this, um, but the banknote is for $100 trillion. <laughs> Say that again, $100 trillion. Why is it such an interesting gift? Because it's valueless. It cannot buy you a loaf of bread. If you bought bread by the slice, it might get you half a slice. It's useless. Actually, the paper is worth more than the denominator. That's what's happened to the sun. He's become nothing, literally nothing. Looks like a son, talks like a son, looks like a lad, smells like a lad, but socially dead, absolutely dead. You probably know that um, in the years, uh, in this country certainly, when the death penalty was still in play, condemned prisoners were not allowed, not permitted, to write a will because to them and to the eyes of the law, they no longer had a value. So even when they went to the gallows, everything that they wanted to leave and say was void. No will, no value. We're doing, in other words, on the gallows, nothing to nothing. You've ceased to be a person. So maybe the only honorable way forward for the father here however much he loved the boy, would be to just accept his loss. And indeed, that seems to be the contract in the parable. The boy kind of knows that. You know, I can come back, maybe I'll get a job, you know, part-time waiting and feeding pigs on the farm, you know, at least a little bit of income and so forth. But we need to remember the father was not free, socially and culturally, probably religiously, to actually indulge the son in the way that he does. 
And that's why when you start to read the parable in a slightly more traditional way, um, probably, I think, against slightly what Paula was saying the other day, you need to look at how the parable begins to end. The son who was dead has come to life. It's that business, come to life. It's not flowery language. It's not a kind of sort of rhetorical flourish. This really is about resurrecting somebody who's been lost forever and gone. So what you have here now in um, uh, sort of religious, spiritual, theological terms is what I would call a notion of transvaluation, the reversal of death and life, life and death. What we've got here is something going on with substitution and exchange. And again, reading it in a slightly more traditional way, I suppose, the father displays a generosity that is far in excess of the standards of ancient Mediterranean behavior. He needn't have divided the property. He didn't need to look out for the returning son. He didn't need to run down the road. He didn't need to kiss the son's neck. He did not need to smother with him with hugs. He didn't need to slaughter the fatted calf. He didn't need to have the celebration. All of this is done so shame is abolished and the lad is restored. Now, of course, we have to remember in all this that every single gesture that the father makes on that road towards the son is one that diminishes the father. And the chatty, noisy neighbors would be looking at this saying, well, has the father got no standards? Has he got no moral spine? Has he lost any sense of decency and family worth? Can he not see that he has demeaned himself in all of these acts by simply going not just soft in the heart, but totally soft in the head? He's clearly lost the plot. But what this parable says is, you know, God has lost his head and his heart to you. And not just to you, but to the world. As the mystics say, God does definitely have one weakness, just one, his heart. It's too darn soft. That's what the mystics say. And that's what this parable expresses. Mark Twain once famously said that describing the Lord as a jealous God is a bit like saying that God is a small God and fretful about small things. And this parable is just the reverse of that. It's really saying that God's generosity is totally proportionate to God's glory, which is infinite, radiant, and eye-numbingly blinding. As my teacher and mentor used to say ages ago, the main problem facing the church today is the same problem it's always had and has never come to terms with. And do you know what that problem is? It's not bums on pews, it's not numbers, it's not the next fresh expression, it's not what to do about gender or sexuality. No, says my mentor, the main problem the church has is coping with the overwhelming abundance of God. It just can't hack it. The overwhelming abundance of God is a problem for the church because it's a judgment against us. And once you get with that, that God's abundance is overwhelming, it's then love, justice, mercy, profligate, ah, prodigal. Because you know God is very prodigal with God's love, wasteful, just chucks it around anywhere, you know. Don't think about trying to direct God's attention to the places that are deserving because God is really not interested in your opinion. <laughs> not at all. God will go where God wants with God's love. God will speak through whatever God likes. Sometimes through people, occasionally through sermons, but just for tricks, Balaam's ass. Why ever not? Because God is God. The overwhelming abundance of God is where you start from. And what this parable does is it serves that up to us in absolute spades. It says, don't you be going rationing this grace and mercy and love and forgiveness. I'll have none of that. You start with this notion 
that home is where we all belong. And of course, the tragedy of the older son is that the son wastes the opportunity to see that. The son just picks up on the diminishing of the father, the diminishment that the the younger son has brought, um, can't see that God is endlessly generous. And the tragedy of the older son is that they miss that, he misses that. And the lesson is, there's a wideness in God's mercy, like the wideness of the sea. And you can't get it all in your view. There's too much of it, just too much. I've uh, included in the handout uh, a little reference to uh, Simon Sharma's um, uh, commentary on uh, Rembrandt's painting, which is extremely well known, um, hangs uh, in St. Petersburg. Um, And uh, I won't uh, detain you by uh, reading out the, the extract from Sharma. But it's simply to say that this parable actually draws us all home together in the end, where there are actually difficult conversations about who the home belongs to. Whose is this place? To whom does the church belong? It's not mine, it's not yours. It doesn't belong to the archbishop, it belongs to God. And therefore, it should be run in a way that's genuinely incorporative, generous, inclusive, expansive, loving, forgiving, shame, smashing. Because it ought to be a bit like the kingdom, unconditional, welcome. Come whoever you are, no matter what you think you've done, no matter what you think is being said about you, no matter what shame you bring, because that's on the whole how Christ worked with the people he worked with. Remember, Jesus is the body language of God. And therefore, the acting out in the flesh of Jesus, the skin of Jesus, the speech, the sight, the hearing of Jesus is all about that living act of incorporation that is there to draw in all these people who otherwise would not get a look in. The elder son, in the end, I think, bears the opposite title of prodigal. Because if you look again in your dictionaries, the antonym of prodigal is cautious, stingy, rationing. And the one thing you can say about God, and you can say many things about God, but the one thing I think you can say about God is that God is not really cautious. Because caution, I think, would not give you the incarnation, or Balaam's ass, or indeed much else. Coping with overwhelming love is the task of the church. And I think that's why this parable of the prodigal family throws a question back to us. It's about misguided, misjudging characters in Elton John's Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, on the road to the Wizard of Oz, the lost and the found in Bunyan's progress, Dick Whittington, call it what you want. Question. Can our churches embody that fathomless grace and prodigal love that's exhibited in that homecoming and expressed through the Father to the sons and then loops back again even on the Father and says, you too, even though you've made mistakes, we're going to have a party and a celebration to remind everybody that they belong I dare to hope the church can live like that, but I know it's a constant struggle. Two final points. In God's life, a bit like the Wizard of Oz, there's no place like home. But all you have to do to appreciate that is to understand a little bit like an African farm. There's no fence, there's no boundary. It's just a question of knowing where the farmhouse is and working out whether you're moving towards it, away from it, around it, or near it. But everything and everybody on an African farm, no matter how far you are from that farmhouse, belongs. But there are no fences. And if the kingdom's like that, then so be the church. 
And my last cultural reference. I think in the end what this parable says to us is a little bit like what the eagles have to say in Hotel California. You can check out, but you can never leave. <laughs> Thank you. I think there are probably a few minutes for questions. Yep, there's a roving mic to whiz around. One at the back. Thank you very much. It's a uh, it's very inspiring um, interpretation of the prodigal son. But coming from the Middle East, um, you said the, the father got light in his head and his, his, in his heart to run to, mm. the, um, to the sun. Actually, according to the Middle East culture, this is against the nature of a father. That's right. Father would not hold his abaya. Yeah, galabaya, yes. That's yeah, right. mm. and run in the street yep. to meet the sun. This is not a man in his probably 50s or 60s that is not. But the genius point, I believe, as a, as a Syrian man, I'm looking at it, is that there is no mother in the, in the parable. But actually, the mother would have done that. I would have imagined my mother doing that in Syria, but my father wouldn't do it. Okay. So. Cool. The genius way is saying, is Jesus saying to us that God is not a father only. God is a father and a mother. And then he gives the, the mother role, the woman's role, in, in celebrating the finding of the, of the coin. Yep. So it's, it's the light head and the light heart of the father is that the mother is visualized running down the street yep. holding the sun. Thank you. That's great. That's, that's a fantastic point. And um, let me just say, so um, the, the hitching up of the Galileo in order to run, um, as the gentleman said, is, is completely out of character uh, for a father to do. If you ever want to make sense of that extraordinary psalm, thou dost not delight in any man's legs. Because real men walk you know, a bit like bishops in processions. They kind of glide, you know? <laughs> so they're not supposed to run. People who run, women, children, slaves, they can run, that's okay, that's seemly. So what the parable's doing, even just with that little kind of thing there, is it's saying, this father's behaving like a mother, a child, or a slave, but not, not behaving like a father. So again, it's, it's, it's excessively out of role. And then you can decide yourselves, really, depending on what you're doing with this text, whether, in fact, uh, the father's acting counter to being a father or whether we're being invited to think about the father as being slave, child, mother. So again, it's the running and it's the act of running and the necessity of that running that pushes us down this line. You can then decide, actually, whether the father's doing this deliberately and consciously or because the father himself is lost in his role and therefore, again, slightly lost the plot. And that, in one way, doesn't particularly matter. But the point is, uh, as the psalm confirms, thou dost not delight in any man's legs. So, you know, I always want to sort of say to, you know, Scottish Presbyterians, be careful of your kilts. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, how do we really grapple with that generous, unmitigated um, love, whilst also um, not, I want to say, not misapplying it in a way that safeguards abusive behaviours within the church yeah. Um, yeah. and in any community? Because yeah. you often, well, that's right. 
Thanks so much. No, again, great question. And of course, you know, had there been more time, uh, we'd have spent an awful lot of energy on shame and why it needs to be distanced from communities and individuals, why it's there, and why people don't want to be infected by it. And of course, the reality, and what's interesting about Jesus being the body language of God, is his persistent um, engagement with people who are tainting him all the time, constantly letting his body, his conversation, his company get polluted by people that the, the scribes and the Pharisees are saying, well, you, you, know, you shouldn't really be associating with these people, really. So it's the church, in a sense, willing to be grubby and forgiving and expansive. It's back to my point about you know, the overwhelming abundance of God being the problem for the church. You need to start from that place and say, well, actually, who are the people in our communities and in our wider world um, who are so far and deep in the shadows that nobody talks to them? And people even don't talk about them, actually. So it's, it, it's a hard, hard journey, I think. But uh, the journey begins in here. And actually, it begins with an honest conversation with yourself, actually, about actually what you loathe and what disgusts you. And that might be about yourself as much as actually what's external to you. So this is hard spiritual work. Now, the parable isn't, isn't giving you um, an explicit invitation to do that, but it is inviting you into a very, very deep story about the nature of prodigality. Wastefulness, excessiveness, that's what's so interesting about that Harry Smart poem. Because, of course, it's offensive, and I accept that. Um, but um, it's pushing it right back in your face and saying to me and to you, look, and these are people who really have screwed up big time. And you know what? Um, God's got just as much for them as for you. What are you going to do about it? It's a kind of come on poem in a way. And uh, that's why the title of this talk is A Fool's Pardon, because we don't think fools deserve it. Not really. You know, we think we should educate them first. And then, you know, maybe, maybe they'll get a pardon. But only really, you know, if they actually join the club loyalty bonus scheme that we're operating um, and they're fully signed up members. And the parable says that's, that's not how this works. That's not how God's love works. So it's getting deeply in touch with that soft heart that really is God. But um, it's hard work, and it's hard work in a church too. Time for one more. I wanted to uh, ask following Luther, if the prodigal was all we had, it was enough. What do you think the earlier two stories add to the story of the prodigal? Why are the three together? Um, well, easy grouping for Luke is the obvious answer. Um, and, um, you know, that's how the gospel is constructed. Um, I, I, think there's some, I think there's something uh, playful going on uh, as well about uh, transvaluation, as I intimated. Uh, the sheep and the coin have value. Uh, it's easy for us to assume that the, the looker for the sheep is the shepherd, and we can equate that with Jesus. We tend, I'm afraid, when we look at the woman who's looking for the coin, to think, no, it's just a woman, really. But again, we're, we're invited, in a sense, to, to see something going on here about the constant sweeping and searching, the persistence, in a sense, of the woman as being something proper about the nature of God. But I think the, the, way the, the way that chapter ends, bearing in mind the chapters are all artificial distinctions, um, you've got a very different kind of lostness. I think the parables building, the, the, three, the, the three are really building on the sense of lostness. I mean, in the end, you can afford to lose a sheep. You can afford to lose a coin. Um, but nobody wants to lose a son because it, it's not like being bereaved. Actually, it's not. It's not that loss. Because you could talk about that. And you could say, well, you know, I have a son and tragically died and that kind of thing. This is something that family could never talk about. He is dead in every way. Economically, socially, culturally, conversationally, gone. That's it. 
there's no way of raising that subject or that person again. And that's, I think, what's happening. You were given two little aperitifs where value is value, but you could live without the value. And the son, really, the lost son, turns it on its head and says, well, I'm going to now give you a story in which I'm going to give you something that's redeemed and restored, but actually has absolutely no value. I mean, it's a thumping story, actually, about your resurrection and mine and what we mean to God. You get your value back, and you don't deserve it, but you do.